Can you guess what's similar between the Tron movie, Minecraft, as well as Blender? Well, they all use the same base algorithm to create noise. And that algorithm is called Perlin noise. In today's video, we're going to actually take a peek behind the noise texture to find out what exactly happens when you use this. With that, let's actually demystify the noise texture. The first thing that we need to know is the difference between random noise as well as Perlin noise. Random noise is essentially like the white noise. And if you want to know more about the white noise, you can take a look at this video over here where we talk about the white noise texture in more detail. However, what you need to know is that when you actually scale up or zoom into white noise, it will always remain completely random. That is, no pixel will be dependent on the pixels next to it. No matter how you switch it up, it'll always have complete randomness. Another property of white noise is that it's indistinguishable from any other portion of white noise. For example, we have this plane that's added in and no matter where we place the plane, if we just switch off overlays, it becomes almost impossible to distinguish where the edges of those planes lie. While we move the plane around, you might be able to briefly tell where the plane is, but the moment we stop moving it, it completely blends in with the background. So that is a very important property of actual random noise. However, the same does not occur with Perlin noise. So the Perlin noise is created in such a way that each pixel is dependent on the pixel next to it. There's never going to be an abrupt change between black to white and there'll never be sudden jumps in the values present. It'll always be a smooth transition over a range of pixels. However, the overarching structure will still remain random and that's why you can use noise to generate random values but the random values that are given as an output will have some form of uniformity. This sort of randomness is what's more seen in nature and that's why it was very important to create an algorithm to generate this sort of a noise. So let's take a look at how exactly this noise is created. To simplify the explanation, we'll start off by changing this from 3D to 1D so that we can actually take a look at what one-dimensional noise looks like. Now normally, when you change the noise texture to 1D, we get a W value which determines the fourth dimension in which the noise value is computed. However, we can actually change the W value to see the change in the randomness or the actual lightness of the output and you can see that it never goes from white to black directly or it never has a sudden jump. It's always a smooth transition to a darker value and then a smooth transition to a lighter value, but you never know when it's going to get lighter or darker. So that is exactly how this noise texture works, but we can actually choose a specific axis to vary this on. To choose the specific axis, we can actually take the texture coordinates and separate out the XYZ components. Now, if we want this to vary on the X axis, we can simply take the X axis and plug that into the W axis for the noise texture. That way, you'll see that as the X axis value changes, the lightness value changes accordingly based on the x-axis location of the pixel. So to generate this sort of a pattern, we'll first start off by reducing the scale to 1 so that the variation is reduced and we'll also just unmute this color ramp so that we increase the contrast so that it can be seen a bit better. Now, how do we create this sort of a smooth transition when all we can do is generate a random value for each pixel? For that, let's assume we have a graph where each of these points represents one single pixel and the random value that's attached to this pixel. If we were to draw a line connecting each of these points, it would be very, very random. Now, this is what white noise would look like, but we want it to be Perlin noise where we get a smooth transition, as you can see over here. So that actually depends on the detail of the noise texture as well as the roughness. If we currently look at this by increasing the detail, you can see we get far more bands present on top of the existing bands that we had. So if our detail is set all the way to zero, we have one dark band over here and one light band over here. As we start increasing the detail, you can see that the dark band still remains here. The white band still remains over here, but we're starting to get intermediate bands as well. As we increase the detail to something very, very high, you can still see that there's still the dark band here, still a light band here, but there's various smaller bands added in. So we're going to create that exact effect by using this particular algorithm. We'll assume that our detail is zero and we'll see how we can create this. For that, we have to sample not every single one of these pixels, but only a few of them. So initially, we'll sample this first pixel only and we'll assume that after the pixels end, there's another pixel that's equal to this particular value. So if we sample those and we interpolate it, we see that we need a sample here, a sample here, and this is what the value looks like. So we just get a single 
original value. Now, if we start increasing the details, what happens is we get more octaves. So how we calculate another octave is this particular sampling frequency is going to be doubled, whereas the value perceived will be reduced by half. So right now, if this is a value of one right here, the next time we sample at twice the frequency, the perceived value will assumed to be half of this. So instead of one, the value will actually be considered as 0.5. So what do we mean by doubling the sample frequency? So initially we sampled this one as well as the same one at the end. If we double it, we have to sample this one, the mid value, and then again this one. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So that is what it looks like. We have one value here, the middle value, as well as the same value repeated at the end, and we have to interpolate between them. Now when we interpolate it, we could connect them with straight lines as we did in these green values, or we could actually smoothen it out a bit by using different types of interpolation. If you use Blender a bit, you already know that there's different types of interpolations like Bezier, where we get a smooth curve between different points, or you can also choose different types of easing such as sine or exponential and so on and so forth. So there's some amount of smoothing that's occurred using some form of interpolation and this is what you get. But remember the values that are being perceived is no longer going to be 1 over here but it's going to be 0.5. And then to get the final value this original curve is added in with this particular curve considering the values that we took. So hopefully I'm able to explain it well enough. Let's say this original curve has a value of 0.5. 0.8. In that case, this new curve, this point will not be given a value of 0.8, but it will be given half the value. So 0.4. If using the original curve, this point would have had a value of let's say 0.3 in the new curve, this is not going to be considered as 0.3. It's going to be considered half of that. So it'll be 1.5. Now these values are going to be added in for the curves to get a resulting curve. And each of these is called one octave. So if we add in the next octave, what we'd get is this because we sample this value and then the mid point between this value and this value, which is over here, as well as the midpoint between this and this, which is over here. Then we connect them using some form of interpolation and we get this curve. But remember, the weight of this is not going to be the same. It's going to start reducing. So this is the third octave. So it's going to be equal to a value of only 0.2. So if you see the first octave had a value of 0.8, then the second octave had a value of 0.4. And now the third octave is going to have a value of half of that which is 0.2. So similarly this point was 0.3 then it became 1.5 for the second octave. For the third octave it'll be 0.75 and again the resultant curve is just going to add them up. So now this is what the fourth octave would look like and essentially if we have a low detail it'll only consider very few octaves and it'll add them up and if you were to add in all of these octaves you would get a result that looks like this. So as you can see the points that initially started off as completely random points are now looking like a smoother curve. If you connect them up you get a curve like this and this is essentially Perlin noise. The x values are going to be just like this where we have a dark patch and a light patch and in our case you can also see that we'd have a darker patch here, a lighter patch here followed by a slight darker patch and that's how it works. But if we start adding in even more octaves the main curve will remain just like this but will have even smaller variations added in on top of this at different levels. So the more detail we add in, the more number of octaves that are calculated and the more this curve tends to break up that smoothness. So it still has this overarching shape because that has the maximum weight and every new octave that's added in will have even lesser weights. But even with the lesser weights, they will cause some sort of variation along with that main variation that was created with the first major octave. So that's how it's calculated in one dimension. But what happens in higher dimensions? So if we actually took a look at it right at the start, we had two dimensional curves like this. So we have to actually get this particular algorithm in two dimensions. And to get this done, in two dimensions, we actually use some amount of vector math. If you want to know more about the vector math, you can check out this video over here where we explain vectors in more detail and we demystify the vector math node. But essentially what you have to know is that we take the entire 2D plane and we divide it into some sort of sampling frequency. This is equivalent to the frequencies at which we sampled this. The more number of octaves, the smaller this 
sampling frequency is going to get. Every single time, it's going to be reduced by half. So it'll maybe get smaller like that, and then even smaller, and then even smaller, and so on and so forth. And we'll be adding in the different noises from each of these. But essentially, let's assume that we take this as a sampling frequency for some specific octave. So maybe this could be the fifth octave. In this scenario, the first thing that we do is for each vertex, we calculate a random vector. So maybe for these corners, there are random vectors that are generated like this. The next thing that has to be generated are the direction vectors, which are from the corners to the center of each of these grids. So maybe we'll take a look at just these nine grids for the sake of this tutorial. So the direction vectors would be something like this, where we have them pointing towards the actual center from each corner. So the direction vectors would look something like this. Now, how we actually calculate Perlin noise is we take each of these vertices and we find the dot product between the random vector and the direction vector over here. So this dot product between the random vector and the direction vector will give us some value for this particular point. Now we do the exact same thing for the four different corners. So even here we'd have some value for the dot product between this and this. Over here we'd have a value for this vector and this vector. And over here we'd have another value for this vector and this vector. Once we calculate those four values, we go ahead and have some sort of a linear interpolation between those four values to actually color in this entire grid based on those values. So the entire grid will get some sort of a gradient to cover the entire pixel. Now, I don't know the best way to show you that, but hopefully you get the idea. So that is actually how we get this particular noise. So hopefully you understood what the scale does as well as what the detail does. But what about this roughness slider? So essentially this roughness slider determines that interpolation that we were talking about between these particular values. If the interpolation is kept at linear, we will get much more abrupt changes. And that's what happens when we have the roughness value at one. We essentially get straight lines between the different values that were calculated. And so we get much more rough texture. However, if we start reducing the roughness, the interpolation between them is no longer kept at linear. And we actually smoothen out the values as we go from one value to the other. So even when we have all of these multiple points present, just like this, instead of connecting them up with straight lines, what it does is it actually tries to calculate the smooth fit between these curves. So even if we do have some points that are present just like this as the higher octaves that should be causing a much more random variation within the main structure, instead of having lines that actually follow each of those individual values to form something like this, when we increase the smoothness, it mathematically interpolates a smooth value between all of those rough values, which will eventually cause it to go something like this instead of going to each and every single one of the points. So if you actually look at it, because we're smoothing it out, it looks looks the same as it was when we did not take into consideration all the higher octaves. The shape that we get is almost the same. So that's why if we actually look at the noise texture, as soon as we reduce the roughness down to zero, it looks almost the same as having a detail value of zero. So we can reduce the detail to zero and increase the roughness. And you see, it looks the exact same. And that's because all of these higher octaves are actually getting smoothened out and it's equivalent to just having the smaller octave. Similarly, if we have a detail down at zero, no matter what we increase the roughness to, it won't make a difference because these higher octaves that actually make the texture rough are not even being calculated. So we get the smooth curve itself. And that's why you have to make sure that we increase the detail to get the correct number of octaves necessary. And then we increase the roughness to actually take those octaves into consideration without smoothing between them. If it's too rough, you can always start ignoring the highest octaves by just reducing the roughness by a bit and making it much smoother. So that is exactly what these values do. Now the distortion actually plays around with the main grid itself. And instead of having these nice square pixels, it distorts this entire grid itself. So that is why we still get the same noise, but it seems to be in slightly weirder shapes. And that's because the square pixel that we might have had over here changes its shape and becomes a completely different shaped pixel itself. So that is how the noise texture works. And genuinely, it's used in so many regions. This Perlin noise was actually developed by Ken Perlin in 1983. It was actually made for the Tron movie. And in fact, it got an Academy Award as well for that movie. The issue was that anything generated by computers was looking too machine-like 
because we couldn't get this nice organic feel. And that's why he developed this algorithm to create this smooth random value that could be used to create textures without having to hand draw them every single time. Overall in Blender, you can actually use this noise texture to create procedural roughness on materials. You can add in scratches and other deformities as well, but you can also use it to distort other textures. And apart from distorting other textures, you can actually distort the original material itself to create some sort of displacement. Beyond that, Perlin noise can be used to procedurally create terrains as well as clouds or even nebulae. Perlin noise is an amazing algorithm and although you don't need to know any of the things that was discussed in this video to actually use the Perlin noise, I genuinely hope that knowing the math behind it gives you a different appreciation not just for the algorithms but for Blender as well. Not just Blender but other 3D programs or any form of texturing software and even games like Minecraft. Until my next video comes out tomorrow, thank you so much for watching, keep creating, and don't forget to stay creative.